upcoming Aaron Jones. Well, good morning. Um, it's kind of exciting. This is early in the morning, but what I'm really happy about is that I live in Lacey and I didn't have to drive two hours to get here. Because I speak all over the country and usually I have to get up at five and drive two hours or th fight traffic or stay somewhere else and not be with my husband. So I was excited to know I'm coming to SPSCC today. So I'm um, excited about that. I want to explain my attire to you. Um, for those who've seen me speak before, I'm usually in a suit and heels. And about two months ago when the Just Do It campaign came out with Colin Kaepernick as the face of it, people lost their minds. And I made a choice to wear Nike every single day. So I, it's all I wear is Nike right now. And I wear Nike, it's my expression that I get to be American the way I want to be American. I get to be a patriot the way I want to be a patriot. And I also believe the Just Do It campaign is what my life stands for, is do you have a crazy, enough, crazy big enough dream that you're willing to sacrifice everything? And I'm going to share my story with you because my dream is crazy big enough that you can't knock me down. And what I hope to encourage you all today is, if your dream is crazy big enough, this Ignite thing can be the thing that propels you into that dream. If your dream is not crazy big enough, all it will take is that little thing. Your computer not working for the day, or your car breaking down to, to kill your dream. You gotta have a dream that's crazy big enough that whatever happens, a relationship breaks up, a kid gets sick, you're willing to keep pursuing that dream. And that's really why I wear Nike every day. Um, I have professional Nike, and I, I'm also a runner, so I have my workout Nike. But I literally wear Nike every single place that I go, even on national stages. And I have skirts, too. I bought every Nike skirt that I can find, <laughs> and every Nike blazer. I can f there are blazers and skirts, so I wear those on stage, too. Always tennis shoes right now, though. And I figure I'm already six feet tall, so with the heels, I was 6'5", anyway. I was intimidating to people, so the tennis shoes are a little less intimidating. <laughs> But they're always a pop of color, too, though. So we gotta, we got to look good in the tennis shoes, OK? Um, but I just wanted to set that out, because I don't want this to be by accident. I, I don't want you to miss that, that how I show up is really intentional. The afro is really intentional. This is how my hair grows. And um, I was ashamed of that until I was 40 years old. So I'm almost 50. I can't believe that. My son turned 24 today. I'm almost 50, and it took me until I was 40 years old to realize that this is how I was made. And as a teacher, I need to show up in all of who I am. And so I stopped straightening my hair, stopped putting chemicals in it, and have worn it this way um, since I was 40. And it's my message to you all, just do you, however you are. Whether you're six feet tall or not even five feet tall, whether you've got straight hair, long hair, curly hair, um, whether you're skinny or tubby, whatever you are, show up in all of yourself. And that's really what I hope to, st to show just in how I show up in spaces. I own who I am. I got big hair and bright shoes and always some big jewelry, too. <laughs> the Nike and the big jewelry, you know? <laughs> kind of clashes a little bit, maybe, or it's just me, right? Um, I am a clash. I mean, that's who I am. I am black and I am white. Um, I am American and I'm European. I am an athlete and I'm an academic. And what I hope to challenge you with today is you are never just one thing. And I think the world would love to put you in a box and fight the box every single day because you can't be your best self if you're trying to be someone else's best self. And that's really what the world is trying to make you do, right? They're trying to keep you in a little box, dress this way, act this way, talk this way, if you want to get ahead. And what I'm here to tell you is if you are your best self, you will become the greatest version of you possible and you will change the world. And you don't have to have a title to change the world. You just got to be your best self. And so what you may not know about me, I am the first black woman in the state of Washington to ever run for statewide office. I ran to lead public schools in 2016 and lost by less than one point. Do I look like a loser? No. Guess what? Because I'm a baller, I've had lots of practice losing and getting back up. Losing and getting back up. Losing and Life is about losing and getting back up. The greatest people in the world are not people who haven't had challenge. They're people who had challenge and they got back up. And they didn't allow no or not yet to stop them from pursuing their dream. So is your dream crazy big enough that you're willing to do whatever it takes?
And you don't have to have it all figured out. You don't know what you're gonna do. You have to know what you're gonna do in ten years. But are you willing to be your best you today? Do you have that thing that just makes you happy every day? What is that thing? You have gotta find that thing. And if you haven't found it yet, I dare you. I dare you to think about what moves you every day. So knowing all that about me, which you probably wouldn't know, is that on June 3rd of 1971, I was left in a hospital. My mother was a white woman. She conceived me in 1970 with a black man. And she was told, you will not keep this baby. Because in Minnesota in 1970, 1971, biracial was not a thing that was acceptable. So what we don't realize out here, we have lots of biracial kids. Do you know that the I-5 corridor really between Lacey and South Seattle has the most biracial kids in the country? Why? What's here? There's something unique that's here. And what brought them here, though? What, there's something big here. Not timber? JBLM. So Joint Base Lewis McCord was one of the first military bases that allowed men who were not white to bring wives who were, also, who were white or Asian or whatever, Latina. And so what happened is 30 years ago when Joint Base became that place, the one place that was safe, it just continued. And so if you look at who's here, a lot of that interracial mix was normalized because JBLM brought it here. So when I tell kids I was abandoned because I was biracial, they're like, what? They don't understand that here in Washington State. Those folks who are from the Midwest, you probably, yeah, we know. <laughs> you understand what I'm talking about, right? And Minnesota, yeah, they did not, it was not acceptable. And for those of you who don't know about history, until 1968, it was actually illegal for a black man to be with a white woman. Understand, so I was conceived in 1970, just two years later. Just because you pass a law doesn't make, mean that people think it's acceptable. And so my first day of life, I was abandoned by my mother. It's not about where you start, it's about where you finish. Some of you have had some tough things happen to you. I am sure in the hospital that day, people said, write her off. She's going to be another one of those welfare foster kids. Nothing good's going to come out of her. I'm sure that's what people were saying in that hospital that day. It's not about where you start. It's about where you finish. Do not allow what happened to you yesterday or last year to stop you from being great. And so I was really fortunate. Right away as a little baby, a white couple decided we're going to adopt black babies because nobody wants them. My white parents made a conscious choice to adopt little black babies. The community was not happy about that. I'll just say that much. In 1976, my dad would come home from teaching one day, and he would announce, we're moving to the Netherlands. I thought he said Neverland. <laughs> Peter Pan, because I was five. Um, but my parents knew that raising a little black girl in Minnesota in, 1970, in the 1970s was not going to work. We often think about racism and all that stuff being a, a southern problem. I would suggest it's also a northern problem. It is also a northwest problem, by the way. I spent yesterday in Parkland, Washington, which is not too far from here, the home of PLU, where a black guy just bought a coffee shop and had people come in and call him the N-word. Closed down his shop, opened it again, trying, trying again. People came in with mega hats and just sat in his shop. Imagine. Imagine having a group of older white men with MAGA hats come and sit in your store, make America great again, for those of you that don't know what a MAGA hat is. Come and just sit in your coffee shop and just stare at you, threaten you to call the police on them. That stuff is right here in our community, too. It is everywhere. It's not just a southern problem. And so my parents realized raising Aaron in America is not going to work, and my parents, who had never left this country before, left everything they knew and moved us across an ocean to the Netherlands, a language they didn't speak at all, to a job my dad really knew nothing about. He was a teacher. He took a job at the United Nations School. He had no idea what that was going to be like. It was the most incredible opportunity that my parents could have given me. They had no idea. But guess what? Their dream was crazy big enough they were willing to sacrifice everything for me. I got to meet my first princess when I was nine years old. 
I hosted Barbara Bush at my high school as an 18-year-old for the day. Imagine hosting a president's wife. I spoke in front of the Queen of the Netherlands at 17 years old and again at 18 years old. And I knew as a little kid, I knew in that environment where I was the teacher's kid, everyone else's parents made millions of dollars. I have, I have friends today whose parents run countries. I could tell you which ones. I have friends today who work for the CIA and the FBI because that's what their parents did. And here I was, this little black girl who was given away the day she was born, sitting in the midst of these people. I don't believe in accidents. I believe I was meant to be there. I believe I was meant to be around those kind of people. I believe I was meant to learn the lessons of how that world worked because I was meant to be a world changer. I believe each one of you are meant to be a world changer. And again, it doesn't mean you have to be in politics. I ran for office. I don't want to be a politician, but here's what I do want to do. I want to make sure that every baby in our schools knows that they can be amazing because that's what I got in the Netherlands at my school. I never had a teacher who didn't believe I could be awesome. Never. In fact, I was quadrilingual by the time I was 14 years old. My teachers were like, oh, you want to learn French? You already know Dutch and English. Okay, we'll add that one. And then I got to be 14 and someone said, you should learn Spanish too. And I was like, okay, I got that. Nobody ever doubted it. So guess what? I didn't doubt it either. Oh, you want to play basketball? You play soccer. We'll add that to your repertoire. You play flute? Well, let's add clarinet. I didn't know that I couldn't until I came to America at 18 years old. I would get a scholarship to come to college in the United States, and I tell parents now, do not send your children to a college they haven't ever visited. So y'all are here, but when you go to that four-year school, make sure you visit first. Because school is not school is not school. There are schools that are right for you, and there are schools that are not right for you. But I was coming from Europe. My parents were teachers, and we didn't have money, so I had to trust the brochure. And guess what? All the brochures show you the good stuff. You know that. You all have seen brochures before, right? All the pretty buildings and the trees. <laughs> trees everywhere. Who doesn't like a tree? <laughs> and big old buildings. And I actually got accepted at Princeton University. And Princeton assumed I was one of the rich kids at my school, and Princeton gave me a $1,000 scholarship. That's books. I graduated high school with a 3.9 GPA. Quadrilingual, triple varsity athlete, two instruments in the band. I led a political organization at my school, but they looked at my name, and they looked at the name of my high school, and they assumed she is a rich kid. And Princeton offered me $1,000. And mom and dad said, yeah, not happening. And a couple weeks later, I'd get another letter from a place called Bryn Mawr. All I knew about Bryn Mawr was it was the sister school to Princeton. So I thought, yes, I'm not going to Princeton, but I'm going second best. And I had never visited. And that was the biggest mistake. I got on a plane to America at 18 years old and flew to Philadelphia, which is the location of, and I was really excited to be in Philly because the Cosby Show had been filmed in Philly. And I had been raised on the Cosby Show, and I know Bill Cosby is a hot mess. <laughs> but at the time, I loved Claire Huxtable from the Cosby Show. I wanted to be Claire Huxtable. And I was excited to come to Philly. I wanted to live life like the black people in Philly. And so I got on a plane and came to America. And we get off the plane at midnight. It's all dark outside. And we get in a taxi to drive out to my college town. And we drive, and we drive, and we are not in the city anymore. And the houses are bigger and bigger and bigger. And my mom falls asleep in the taxi, and we get to Bryn Mawr Town. And the very first sign in the town is Bryn Mawr Cricket Club. Now, first of all, cricket. Who plays cricket? Weird people. Weird rich people. Yeah. OK? If you're black playing cricket, you're in some other country, somewhere else that was colonized by the British. But um, Bryn Mawr Cricket Club, no coloreds or Jews allowed here. On the main street at Bryn Mawr town. Not even a mile from the college campus. No coloreds or Jews allowed here. This is my welcome to America. Do you know that sign would not come down until 2012? I just learned from my friends. No, he's from Philly, West Philly. So 
this place has not changed a whole lot. But I will tell you, I have never been so afraid as I was that moment, seeing that sign and realizing, if it's okay to put a sign like that on the main street, what is my life going to be like here? And I did not wake my white mother up because I knew she'd have me on the next plane home and I'd worked too hard to get to America. So I didn't wake her up. But here's what I'll tell you about my first year of college. I was called the N-word so many times I stopped counting. There was not a store that I went to in Bryn Mawr where I was not followed by security. When my parents came to visit me for the first time at Thanksgiving break, it took four restaurants before they would seat us together, my white parents and me. And in fact, in the fourth restaurant, they'd seat us in a back room and close the door. And that was my first year in America. I didn't have an Ignite program with adults who cared about me. I remember going to my, my dean, my academic advisor, and saying to her, you know, I think I want to major in English, French, and Spanish. And she said to me, you, are you sure you can do that? And what I would say today is I speak four. I'm just picking three of those. But at the time, I remember doubting myself for the first time. She didn't think I can do it. Maybe I can't. Maybe I'm not really smart. Here's the beauty of what you all have. You all have some adults who are going to speak life into you. That is not my experience as a freshman in college. And in fact, I would play soccer and basketball for my college that year. And at the end of basketball season, when I no longer had community, I stopped going to class. I stopped eating. I stopped leaving my dorm room. I would lay in my bed in the dark all day. For days at a time, I stopped caring about school. I stopped believing that I could be smart. I stopped believing I could be a world changer. And April came, and it was that first weekend in April. And I'll never forget this. On a Friday night, I'm laying in my bed in the dark, and I prayed this prayer, God, I wish you would just take my life because I think I'm a mistake. I think being adopted was a mistake. I think believing I could be a world changer was a mistake. I just, God, would you just let me not wake up tomorrow? But tomorrow would come, and I'd wake up, and it was bright, sunny outside, and it was 1990, April 1990. It was a Saturday morning, and the sun was shining, and I had this weird urge to go for a walk, and I put my tennis shoes and shorts on, and I just started walking, and I had my headphones on, and I'm just walking, I'm walking, and I come upon this neighborhood, and it's suddenly all these black people. I'm like, there are black people here. I have not seen black people in a long time. And there are all these black people, and I see a basketball game about to start. There are all these men shooting around, and this one really tall guy looks at me, and he says, you, we need one more. They had nine guys. They needed one more to play five on five, and it happened to be a guy named Dr. J. And if you're not a basketball player, you may have no idea who this man is, but one of the greatest NBA players ever happened to be playing on this court that day. He's like, you, we need you now. And I would play with Dr. J that day in his sense. And when the game was over, we played for hours. And when the game was over that day, I sat on the sidelines with four young black men. They were all from North Philadelphia. And if you've never been to the East Coast, there's West Philly and then there's North Philly. <laughs> North Philly is one of the worst ghettos in the United States. And um, these four boys were all from North Philly. Not one of them was still in high school. They talked about schools that were broken down where teachers didn't care about them. They didn't have enough books. They didn't have enough chairs and classrooms. And I, I'm sitting there thinking, not enough chairs and books. How do you call it school? And I said to these boys, so what's your dream for the future if you are not going to go to high school? And each boy said these words, Aaron, we don't plan to live to be 21. Why would we dream about the future? And it was in that moment I found my dream that was bigger than me. I realized in that moment, oh my gosh, I was made black and white from the very beginning. I was born in America and raised in a country that believed in me. I am an athlete and an academic for a reason, and I will give up the rest of my life to being a champion for young people. I will be a champion to make sure that every kid that I touch realizes that they are amazing, that their life has purpose. And I knew that I needed to become the very thing I had fought my entire life. I do not want to be like my parents. I do not want to be like my parents. I do not want to be a teacher. Yes, I must be a teacher. <laughs> when I became a teacher, and I've been working in schools now for the last 28 years, 
serving in some of the poorest communities in our country from North Philly to South Bend, Indiana, to Columbus, Ohio, to Tacoma on the Hilltop, to Spokane and Hilliard, which is kind of the Spokane version of the Hilltop, um, really advocating for young people, black kids, white kids, Latino kids, um, every kind of kid, LGBTQ students. How do we make sure that every one of the students that walks through our school system knows that they are amazing? knows that they have purpose, knows that they have gifts and talents. And that's my crazy big enough dream. It's why I ran for office. I'm tired of seeing politicians make choices for you. Politicians who don't really care about children <coughs> making decisions about children. And so even when I lost, I've spoken to 200,000 children since I lost my election. Every one of the losses in your life is merely a change of direction. It's not an end. Loss is coming, you guys. You're going to fail a test at some point. You're going to fail a paper at some point. Don't allow that to paralyze you. See it as an opportunity to learn something new. See it as an opportunity to connect to someone new. And, and so I want to close by, by sharing three thoughts. Number one, it's not about where you start. It's about where you finish. Today is just the beginning. You showed up today. That's number one. How are you going to finish, though? Because if you show up today but don't show up tomorrow, today doesn't really matter. You've got to keep showing up, keep showing up, keep showing up. Number two, your choices matter. So are you going to choose to show up every day, not just show up and do time, but show up and make the most of your time? Are you going to use school to become your best self? Because you can go through the motions and show up at class every day and turn in something, but if you don't use school to become the best version of you, it's a waste of your time and it's a waste of your professor's time and your parents' money or whoever's money you're paying or their money. Don't waste their money. Don't waste your money. Your life matters too much. And last thing I would challenge you is greatness is not about being rich and famous and it's not about titles. It's not about, have, I have no title right now. I am Aaron Jones. That's, that's who I am. I have my own business. I don't have a leadership title. It's not what life is about. Life is about how are you showing up in spaces and how are you affecting the spaces you show up in. And you don't have to have a title for that. So as you think about walking into this new season of your life, those of you who are joining the Ignite program, use the adults here. That's what they get paid for. They're here to serve you. They're here to walk alongside you. Use them. They can't help you if you never go ask for help. And don't be too proud to ask for help. We all need it. Even I need it. I got to try out for the WNBA when I was 29 years old. I was the oldest woman with the most children to try out for the WNBA. <laughs> and I got lots of help. I got lots of help. I went to everybody and said, I need weight training. I don't know how to do this. Somebody help me out. Don't ever be too proud to ask for help because you can't become your best self without some support around you. So use these people. But also, show up as your best self every day. Your best self is never going to be perfect. So if you're waiting for perfection, stop now. It's not coming. Okay? <laughs> Show up as your best self every day, and your best self tomorrow should be better than today. Seek to be better next week than you were this week. But when you make a mistake and you fall down, don't allow that to stop you from pursuing your dream. Because again, loss is coming. And some of the loss and challenge is going to be stuff you bring on yourself, others you have no control over. And so see each one as this opportunity to change your direction and to propel you into a new destination. Um, thank you for taking care of yourself and investing in yourself. Both my kids went to school here. My two younger kids went to school here. Um, we love this place. SPSCC is a great place. This space is a great space. So use this space. My daughter studied here every day. It's a great space to just hang out and build community. You need community. You can't do life alone. So utilize the people around you. This is your home away from home. You don't always have to like each other, but always love each other. That's what I tell my kids all the time. I may not like what you do sometimes, but I will show you respect every day. Right? And, um, and I'm with you in spirit cheering you on. Say hello to me when you see me in community. Please do not just walk by me. <laughs> I talk to a lot of people, so I may not remember you, but you will remember me. So when you see me at the mall, say hello. Okay? <laughs> And I, I will be cheering you on from Lacey Washington. Thank you.
Okay, I wanna read I wanna read a quote to you. This is my favorite quote. I try to read this wherever I go. It's it's something I read as much for myself as for you. And it was made famous by Nelson Mandela the day he became president, um, but it was written by a woman named Marianne Williamson. And it is a poem prayer. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as the children do. We are born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us. It is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. So go out there and be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous. Thank you.